morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday morning, especially to our people joining us from the West Coast. My name is Gabrielle Hall, and I'm the program assistant for international affairs at the Ralph J. Bunch <clears throat> International Affairs Center at Howard University. So thank you for joining us for our November edition of Bunch Talks, Shaping Our Future. Um, and this year for our annual series, we are focused on the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our director, the Bunch Center director, Tania Hope, who is going to give us a welcome and then we will go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, my name is Tania Hope. I'm the director of the Ralph J. Bunch International Affairs Center at Howard University. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your schedules to join us this morning. Um, we are really excited for today's session. Um, today's session is part of our annual lecture series, which this year is focusing on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Today's uh, goal is goal number four, quality education that we'll be focusing on. Um, but uh, we, are, uh, we are really excited uh, to welcome our speakers this morning um, and hope that you will join us for future Bunch Talks, uh, which will be happening uh, the remainder of the academic year. Every month we'll feature another sustainable development goal. And luckily with, um, well, I don't know about luckily, but the silver lining of, of the situation that we are all in is that you can join us uh, through this medium, uh, from the comfort of your home uh, and, and participate in our very dynamic conversations. We have had great turnout for the last um, two sessions and, and today is, is no exception. So thank you all again for joining us. Um, I wanna thank Gabrielle for all of the work that she has put in to bring this session to fruition. I um, am very, I'm really, I'm really excited about this session. I think that the panelists that have been assembled here are stellar. I didn't tell Dr. Jackson this, but I've basically been following him for years with the Asia Society and all of the work that the Asia Society has been doing around global education because uh, originally I was much more focused on K-12 education and, and international education in that in that space. Um, so I've been a big fan of the Asia Society for a long time and was really happy that we we're able to find a space for him to come in and share with us uh, some of the work that they do at Asia Society. And of course, Dr. Shockley uh, and all the work that you've been doing uh, in Colombia and, and elsewhere, um, your research. So I'm really excited. Ms. Thomas, thank you for joining us. And <clears throat> Lindsay, my fellow helps, uh, here. Thank you for moderating this morning. Um, I'm really excited and I will stop talking so that we can get down to business. Thank you all very much. If you don't follow us on social media, please do so. We are very engaged on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So feel free to tweet about um, our session this morning and tag the Bunch Center, tag our speakers, um, and let's share with everyone the great work that everyone here is doing. So thank you all very much. Let's go. Great, uh, thank you so much uh, Tania and Gabrielle for organizing the Bunch Talks on the SDGs. This topic is so incredibly uh, relevant and timely for right now. So we're gonna go ahead and jump on in. I'm pleased to be celebrating the 20th anniversary of International Education Week and to be facilitating a dialogue regarding the important intersections between quality education, culture, and then linking this to the sustainable development goals. Uh, UNESCO asserts that culture, culture, uh, quote, is who we are and what shapes our identity. No development can be sustainable without including culture. In 2015, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with 17 ambitious universal goals to transform our world. 
UNESCO ensures that the role of culture is recognized through the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, including those focusing on quality education, inclusive societies, and gender equality. Culture, again, is the interconnected thread that informs policy and practices to ensure equitable and inclusive education. Education and culture operate in tandem and are not mutually exclusive. Both are key pillars to achieving equitable and a just society, not only within our national borders, but also internationally. Over the course of 2020, we have definitely witnessed the relevance of education and how restrictions to accessing a quality education have profound and systemic implications. According to the Sustainable Development Goals 2020 report, school closures have kept 90% of children, of students worldwide, that's 1.57 billion students out of school and caused 370 million children to miss out on school meals that they desperately depend upon. The lack of access to computers and the internet at home means that remote learning is out of reach for many students. About 70 countries reported moderate to severe disruptions or a total suspension of childhood vaccinations during March and April of 2020, which has and still does have uh, a critical effect now more than ever. As for families, more of them are falling into extreme poverty and children living in poverty are at a much greater risk of child labor, child marriage, child trafficking. An estimated 55 million students in the United States were out of school due to the COVID pandemic, leaving educational systems scrambling to meet the, the needs of schools and families and students. And under resource schools, which have already been grappling with funding deficits Providing a quality education that addresses students' social, emotional, and academic needs have been even more challenging. Sustainable development acknowledges that educational outcomes, social justice, cultural diversity, and intercultural dialogue are inextricably linked. Employing a cultural lens allows for educators, policymakers to have a better understanding of the intersectional nature of these challenges and it enhances our ability to respond. The focus of our discussion for today centers on why culturally relevant education is necessary for a just and equal society, both globally and domestically. We have leading scholars and experts with us today who are going to unpack this topic and provide clear takeaways and recommendations in terms of how we all can be committed to equitable education internationally and right here at home. So I am going to go ahead and begin by introducing our first panelist, which is Dr. Shockley. Dr. Shockley is a professor at Howard University and the School of Education Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. Previously, he was the professor of urban educational leadership in the Department of Advanced Studies Leadership and Policy in the School of Education and Urban Studies at Morgan State University. Prior to working at Morgan, Dr. Shockley was associate professor at George Mason University, where he turned practicing classroom teachers in the master's degree program, which focused on teacher transformation. He has authored numerous articles and two books on the broader topic of African-American education. Dr. Shockley's most recent book is entitled The Miseducation of Black Children. He has also published works in the journals such as the Journal of Negro Education, the Journal of Black Studies, International Journal of Qualitative Studies and Education, the International Journal of Critical Pedagogy, just to name a few. In addition to his work as a professor and researcher, he served as a founding board member for a charter school in Washington, DC. 
Dr. Shockley holds a PhD in organizational leadership and policy from the University of Maryland College Park. In addition to all of his scholarly pursuits, Dr. Shockley has been a mentor in many inner city youth, and I would also add to many of us in our doctoral program here. His background is a college football player, college student leader, and community activists have helped him relate to the pursuits of urban youth. He is an official living legend for his work as a community activist in Cincinnati, Ohio. At the same time, Dr. Shockley teaches classical piano to a completely different demographic of youth and adults. Our next panelist is Dr. Anthony Jackson. Dr. Jackson oversees the Center for Global Education at Asia Society, a global platform for collaboratively advancing education for global competence for all. The Center's multifaceted approach includes the International Schools Network, a network of over 35 schools around the United States that systematically integrate a global focus within the curriculum. Global Learning Beyond Schools, which supports globalizing youth programs, including after school and community programs. The Global Citizens Education Network, a learning community of high performing Asian and North American urban school districts dedicated to solving common high priority problems of practice and policy. And the China Learning Initiative, which provides national leadership to support learning of Chinese language and culture. Trained in both developmental psychology and education, Dr. Jackson is one of the nation's leading experts on secondary school education reform and adolescent development. Dr. Jackson directed the Carnegie Corporation's Task Force on Education for Young Adolescents, which produced the groundbreaking report, Turning Points, Educating Adolescents in the 21st Century, and co-authored the seminal follow-up blueprint, Turning Points 2000, considered one of the most influential books in middle school education reform. His most recent work is Education for Global Competence, Preparing Our Youth to Engaging the World. Dr. Jackson holds a BA from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MA and PhD in Education and Psychology from the University of Michigan. Ms. Ava Thomas is the Assistant Director of Racial and Educational Justice for the North Shore School District. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Community Psychology and Master's of Art degree in Cultural Studies from the University of Washington, Bothell. She also obtained her program administrative certification from Danforth Educational Leadership Program at the University of Washington. Ms. Thomas grounds her practice at the intersection of Black feminist thought, cultural studies, critical pedagogy, and educational leadership and policy. Through her graduate research, Ms. Thomas theorized and examined the need to cultivate affinity-based spaces in school through Black girlhood studies as an approach to emancipatory love and education for and with Black girls. Representing the Racial and Educational Justice Department, Ms. Thomas and her team believe it is critical for North Shore to critique oppressive power structures, diminish institutional barriers, build collaborative solidarities, foster justice-driven adaptive change, and shift leadership and pedagogical lenses through scholarly practitioner frameworks. We have such an amazing and dynamic team with us today. Um, we have such a robust discussion in store for all of you. So we are going to go ahead and shift gears now to our very first panelist, which is Dr. Shockley. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And thank you to uh, Toniha and to Gabrielle for the invitation today. Thank you, Lindsay, for your work with this group. Um, I'm very proud to see uh, two ELPS students holding it down over in the International Center. So this is a wonderful thing to see. Um, I'm going to share my screen in hopes that this all works properly. Um, 
and uh, let me know. If you cannot see the screen, let me know now and we can try to make some adjustments. Can you see it? We can see it. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so what is culturally relevant education uh, and, and is, it, is it necessary? I'm gonna just uh, start off by uh, talking about just definition, just in terms of the definition, Gloria Latson Billings and Richard Milner uh, taking some definition from them. Culturally relevant education is a conceptual framework that recognizes the importance of including students' cultural backgrounds, interests, and lived experiences in all aspects of teaching, learning, and in the classroom and across the school. So that's what some of our leading scholars are saying culturally relevant education is. What I want to talk to you next about is um, what the problem is and you know why kids aren't getting are not getting a culturally relevant education. And I want to use Dr. Francis Cress Welsing's uh, definition of racism, white supremacy as the overlay for why we're not getting a culturally relevant education. Dr. Welsing says that racism, white supremacy is the local and global power system and dynamic. I think it's important to note, she's saying it's a local and global system, not just a set of beliefs and ideas about people, but a system that is structured and maintained by persons who classify themselves as white whether consciously or subconsciously determined, which consists of patterns of perception, logic, symbol formation, thought, speech, action, and emotional response as conducted simultaneously in all areas of human activity, all of them, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, war, and anything that was forgotten. She says that the reason why this has been established is for the ultimate purpose of white genetic survival and to prevent white genetic annihilation on planet Earth. She said it's a planet upon which the vast majority of people are classified as non-white. So what she's saying is that most people on planet Earth are non-white and whites represent a tiny minority. In fact, what she's saying is 10% of the people on planet Earth are white. We use the word majority and minority in the United States, but throughout the world, whites are a very tiny minority. And she says in her book, the book that I'm quoting here, that through the mere sex act, whites can be wiped out genetically. She says that uh, people, people classified as non-white, that racism is white supremacy and that there is no other form of racism on planet Earth. So this is the definition of white supremacy and racism that I think we should be using throughout the country because it has the uh, all of the notions, the ideas, the important concepts and uh, the things that usually get excluded in them for us to actually move the conversation forward. Any conversation about anti-racism should start from this, this point, looking at the definition of racism, white supremacy. Uh, now I wanna talk to you about what next about what happens when we don't have a culturally relevant education. The, the, I'll show you the results of not having the culturally relevant education that uh, uh, Rich, Richard Milner and Gloria Latson Billings are saying that we should have. I need for every all the people who are willing to to unmute themselves because I'm going to need your participation in just a moment. Go ahead and unmute yourself now if you don't have any background noise and I'm going to ask a couple questions. I'm going to ask you to fill in the blank. I want you to fill in the blank. There are no trick questions. Plato, Aristotle, and who is missing, folks? Is it Socrates? I'll take Socrates as the answer. Socrates is missing. Thank you very much. Who is missing? A country that has a capital called Paris. Don't be shy, jump in there. France. I'll take France as an answer. A book about a great fire is called Dante's... Inferno. I'll take Inferno as the correct answer. We're hot to trot, we're doing it. Author of Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare. Shakespeare is the correct answer. So far, we're rolling. Great composer who went deaf writing the Fifth Symphony. Beethoven. 
Beethoven. We're, we're rolling. Who created Facebook? Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg. Correct. All right. Part two. Who was Plato's teacher? Oh. Plato's teacher was Seknufus. Seknufus. Where is the famous capital city of Porto Novo without typing it into Google? <laughs> Benin. It is in Africa, Benin. If you knew that, give yourself a point. If not, no points. Ancient author of the oldest book in the world. Ptahhotep. These are the people who get left out of, of education and history because the education that our young people are receiving is not culturally relevant. World's first playwright. Iconofret. First legendary singer to, who sang of southern trees bearing a strange fruit. Nina Simone. Not the first one. Not the first one. Is it Billy? Billy Holiday. First one, correct. Who invented Kwanzaa? You knew who invented Facebook. Who invented Kwanzaa? Don't type it in there. <laughs> was okay. Malala Karanga. Maulana Karanga. All right, folks. So basically what we're saying here is that without the culturally relevant education, our young people end up not knowing who they are, not knowing information and facts, simple facts like the ones we just talked about here that are important. So a lack of cultural relevancy causes the failure of entire communities. And what's necessary for black children and adults is a culturally relevant African-centered education. And education is actually focused on them as African people. My argument is that when you don't know who you are, you become a pawn and a plaything of those who are directed, powerful, and who do know who they are. They can use their power, their knowledge of their culture, their knowledge of their history and heritage as a weapon against you because you don't know who you are. They can change conversations. They can talk about things that have nothing to do with you and you'll think they do and talk about things that have to do with you, but you don't think they do. And you'll always end up playing second fiddle. You'll always be what I call in the, you'll always be the suburbs and they'll be the main, in the main city. You'll always be a footnote in history and they'll be the main historical story. So it's really important for us to have knowledge of self and that we teach our young people from that culturally relevant perspective, but the substance of cultural relevancy for the children that I write about, African children, black children, is that African centered education. So that's really, really important for us. And, and uh, in the intro, they talked about books that I've done. The latest book that I did actually is on the screen right now. It's called African Centered Education Theory and Practice that was just uh, released this year. I have another one that was released this year called Campus Uprisings. Uh, but relevant to our conversation today, the book that's on the screen, African Centered Education Theory and Practice, talks about what happens when our children do get the kind of education that's necessary for us. For now. I have stories in the book written by other authors and some, some information by myself and the co-author Kofi Lamodi, where we're talking about ideas and like um, instances where education has worked for black children. What happens when it is culturally relevant? And that's when they have an African-centered education. I know that my time was short. I believe I had 10 minutes and I tried to stay within that. Thank you very much. I look forward to learning from the other participants and taking any questions that might come from me later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shockley, for just allowing us to understand more about our culture. Um, and so we are going to turn it over now to our next panelist, Dr. Jackson. Um, thanks very much, uh, Lindsay. And I'm presuming I'm unmuted. So if uh, I'm, my lips are flapping and you can't hear me, somebody say something, but I'm assuming you can hear me. And good morning to everybody. Um, it's great to uh, be a part of, and it's a privilege and an honor to be part of the uh, November Bunch Talks. And thank you, Dr. Shockley. I think uh, what you and I have to say is certainly on the same wavelength. Um, and thanks to all the folks from the Howard University uh, community. I, my, I'm, I'm in Los Angeles right now, and my wife, uh, who is a professor at UCLA, was formerly on staff at Howard for many years. So 
I know the Howard campus and I know the Howard community well, so it's good to be back among family. Um, if there uh, could be background music to my talk today, it would be um, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. Um, even though that song came out nearly 50 years ago, I think it captures what we're feeling right now in this uh, strangest of strange years, 2020. What's going on? I mean, everything seems to be changing, things we could predict are no longer, no longer predictable, things we could never have imagined are happening on a daily basis. I mean, what is going on? And then there's another song that I might want as background music. Um, and it's the song by R.E.M. titled, It's the End of the World as We Know It and I Feel Fine. What I wanna to talk to you about uh, today is my take on what's going on and why it could be the end of at least one aspect of the world as we know it and how education can be the way in which we feel just fine about that. So first to respond to Marvin Gaye's prescient question, what I think is going on is that we are at an, inf an inflection point in human evolution. Um, from an evolutionary perspective, all that matters is survival, whether or not a species survives and thrives depends on how it adapts to the context in which it exists. And for humans, the locus of adaptability has shifted over time from physical characteristics to mental capacities. Uh, to put it simply, nowadays, human survival depends on how we act based on how we think. At the risk of um, oversimplification, how we as humans think can be dichotomized into two competing worldviews. At the core of one worldview is the understanding that it, it is the natural order of things um, for there to be winners and losers. Some people are stronger, smarter, faster, or in myriad, myriad other ways capable of achieving hegemony over others. And in this view, it is legitimate for them to do so. It's just the way things are and always have been. And we can call this the dominance paradigm. The competing worldview, which we can call the egalitarian paradigm, recognizes that people and societies differ in profound ways, but these differences do not require or legitimize dominance of one person over another or one group over another. <clears throat> Instead, the way we think and act towards um, each other is to consider each of us on a level playing field with each other, that we're equally deserving of that which enables anyone to survive and to thrive. Globally, um, we find ourselves in an age defined by the dominance paradigm. You see it everywhere that regimes are holding on to power by brutal and at times lethal exercises in oppression, often through national security or police forces. As in the past, inequities in power and privilege today lead to gross disparities in the resources required, if not to survive, then to live with some semblance of well being. And these growing excesses and inequality are justified by the view that it's, it's just the natural order of things for some to have more than others, be it wealth or power or both. The Black Lives Matter uprising is at its heart, the unleashing of the pent up rage against the dominance paradigm manifested in America as white supremacy by black people who have been systematically subjugated for hundreds of years like countless other assaults and killings of black people by the police in the United States, the murder of George Floyd last June represents the supreme act of white supremacy. When a, when a police officer, Derek Chauvin, stopped the breath and the life of that black man. And in this, uh, we see the police acting as the sharp tip of the cultural spear. Derek Chauvin never for a moment thought he was not in full compliance with the laws and the norms of our culture, a culture that sanctions dominance of white people over all others. Another example of the dominance mindset can be seen through one of the most disturbing aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are literally millions of people in the United States for whom the reality of this threat cannot penetrate their psychological defense mechanisms. These people seem to believe that it is impossible for there to be something that supersedes their individual right to act as they see fit. They seem unwilling to comprehend a situation in which their own survival requires acting for the common good and calls into question their ability to manipulate the world as they desire. So that thing, the virus, must be a hoax. At the root of both systemic racism and denial of the pandemic, is a willingness to jeopardize the lives of millions upon millions of human beings. And this is the same dominance mentality that sanctions a kind of environmental oppression 
aimed at exploiting our planet and denies the urgency of climate change and the rapid worldwide extinction of animal and plant species. What's at work is a worldview which left unchecked, unchecked could lead to our own extinction. And that in my view is what's going on. <clears throat> so the end of the world as we know it, um, if that if that is, uh, if, if we want actually, um, if, if we want, if, if there is the end of the world as we know it, it's certainly not that we want our own extinction. Rather, it is the end of the dominance mindset that could lead to it. What we need to end the dominance paradigm is an education for the 22nd century, not one to prepare us for the 22nd century, but to get us there. If there is to be a 22nd century uh, worth living in, we have to both think and act differently. Our survival requires the ascendancy of the egalitarian paradigm and the subordination of the dominance paradigm. We must act to enable human beings from the very earliest stages of their development as their minds are forming to construct reality from a more egalitarian, the dominant paradigm. What will differentiate 22nd century education is its intention to develop in all youth an egalitarian mindset. If we are to survive as a species, education on a global scale must develop in youth a disposition to act more towards the common good than toward individual gain or group hegemony. Now, what, is a, what does an education for 22nd century look like? Well, for nearly two decades, um, the Center for Global Education at Asia Society has advanced education for global competence as an approach that might at least be a start towards an education for the 22nd century. Education for global competence requires learning and applying critical reasoning, curiosity, and problem-solving skills to understand the world in its full complexity, to see how the local roots of issues like racism and the pandemic are sown by broader global forces. It requires engaging children in experiences designed to develop empathy and to counter the innate psychological mechanism of othering that is at the heart of the dominance paradigm. It's developing the ability to recognize and respect cultural norms that may require shifts in how we relate to and communicate with people from different backgrounds. It's about cultural humility, not cultural hegemony. An education for global competence develops a disposition in youth to take action and to apply cognitive and social emotional skills in ways that balance the value of achieving goals to the cost of achieving them for people and for the planet. Now, if we could look inside classrooms practicing global education, we would see students learning about the roots of American racism in 15th century global economics. We would see them understanding the American civil rights movement of the 1960s by comparing it to the fight against apartheid in South Africa and the struggle for nationhood in India. Students could address the UN De uh, Sustainable Development Goal of providing affordable and, um, uh, affordable and clean energy in science class by creating a solar oven using everyday household materials and then comparing their designs with students in another country through virtual interactions. And we would see courageous teachers organizing safe spaces for students to tell the story of when they first became aware of differences among people based on skin color or dress or language or religion and facilitating their reflection through the arts or writing. What have they learned and how will it change their, their future interactions? From a policy perspective, two things matter most. First, money and mandates to dramatically enhance the capacity of educators to integrate technologies in ways that look nothing like the patchwork attempts at online learning during the pandemic that mimic 20th, if not 19th century teaching. Instead, for example, opportunities arise for complex learning and perspective taking through real world simulations in the application and assessment of knowledge involving global student collaborations. Even more important is systematically building the capacity of the nation's teaching force to teach toward the common good. That involves attracting the best and the brightest and therefore a highly diverse teaching force. It's about actually making it illegal for poor communities, often of color, to be further marginalized by disproportionately fewer education resources. And it means building the curriculum resources and ongoing professional learning that enable teachers to teach toward deep empathetic understanding and from a conscious bias towards equity. Education for global competence is one form of progressive education that is challenging the very purpose of education. It's saying out loud that education has to be about teaching kids to understand the world in its authentic complexity 
and to care about and value each other as much as they value themselves. It's not just another kind of education reform, it is a new kind of social movement and arguably developing in children a mindset not bent on domination, but on the common good is the social movement required in these times. It's how we get to feeling good about the end of the world as we know it, and it's how we evolve. So with that, I thank you and I look forward to the opportunity to uh, respond to your questions and for the dialogue between our speakers. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jackson, for just breaking that down for all of us. Um, the dominance paradigm, preparing teachers uh, to place students at the center of their educational experiences. So thank you so much. Um, we are going to now turn it over to our final uh, panelist for today, which is Ms. Thomas. Hi, thank you for having me, everyone. Um, I really appreciated listening to Dr. Shockley and Dr. Jackson speaking. Um, I'd like to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint um, and would like to talk about work. Um, oh, wait, let me see. There's an advanced setting now, so I can share part of my screen. So I will do that. Um, I'd like to talk about my work in public education um, in P-12 education and really thinking about um, culturally responsive education happening within classrooms and schools, but also happening within um, an institution and that institution being a white supremacist public education system. Um, in terms of culturally um, responsive or culturally relevant education, um, I want to acknowledge that I'm sitting on um, Coast Salish land that was um, continues to be occupied and that is unceded land. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous people who have been here since time immemorial. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge and give an ode to all my ancestors um, that were enslaved and captured and brought here from um, Africa. Um, on my dad's side, um, my ancestors were kidnapped and brought to um, Wadadli. I'm not sure if you know where Wadadli is at, but it's in the Caribbean and it's the indigenous name um, of the island of Antigua, which is um, what Christopher Columbus named the island. So I like to try to reclaim those indigenous roots um, and, and claim those indigenous cultures. Um, and in terms of culturally relevant education and why it's necessary, I'm really clinging on to the why um, and following Simon Sinek's golden circle model, um, we have to address the why first and the purpose of education and the purpose of cultural relevance within um, educational institutions and beyond that. Um, and then we have to think about the how and the what how that comes off the page and what we're actually bringing off the page. Um, I have this little um, meme that I found on the Conscious Kids pay Instagram page by Janelle, I think it's Kabaj or Kubaj, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but it's just grounding. We are not minorities, we have been minoritized. We are not underrepresented, we have been historically excluded, language matters. Um, I, People of color, black people, indigenous people, all people of color, we're not inherently minorities. We're not inherently less than. Um, we're not inherently less intelligent, um, inherently less brilliant, but the functions of the public education system and how those have been founded and the formations that they were founded upon have made us feel that way. Um, and we have to really go back to the importance of language and grounding ourselves in that and understanding that it's not that we're underrepresented because as Dr. Shockley said, um, we make up, people of color make up about 90% of the world. Um, it's not that, it's about dominant formations and systems that are taking shape and continuing to attack and violate our lives. And so um, language does matter. Um, I work in North Shore School District, which is in Washington State. It was a district that was um, created in 1959. We serve close to 24,000 students in 33 schools. We have about 55% white students and 45% students of color. Um, and we have about 80% white teachers. And so when I'm thinking about um, cultural relevance, personally, I'm anchoring it within frameworks of um, radical Black feminism, cultural studies, and ethnic studies, and really grounding that in praxis. Um, I talk about how my work is 
is to um, build and change hearts and minds because we've been socialized um, through dominant ways of thinking. The education system continues to be shaped by um, racism and white supremacy. And so we have to be able to do research and build theory around what does cultural relevance look like? What does justice-driven education look like? And we have to carry that out in our practice. And then we have to be thinking about reflection and self-reflection and collective reflection. Um, some central questions that I continue to pose and work on and think about, um, what does freedom look like and feel like for black women and girls um, and black people and communities? Um, what does it mean to mobilize solidarities across minoritized communities? How do we honor our ancestral legacies and continue to push their work forward? If we were to think about cultural relevance and justice and education, what also must happen in interconnected institutions? And I pose that thinking about um, modern day forms of slavery in terms of um, prisons and the prison industrial complex and thinking about the school to prison pipeline or even better yet, the cradle to prison pipeline. Um, I also pose, um, how do we critically think about functions of power, um, oppression, resistance, healing, and liberation in education? And what is the role of white people in just educational spaces? What did they need to give up and how do they hold themselves and their peers accountable without continuing to put um, the physical and the emotional and the intellectual labor on people of color to do that work for them? Um, in terms of thinking about the why, when I think about the why of cultural relevance, it goes so much beyond representation in textbooks. It's like a systems process. And we, we know this because it's going beyond the institution of education because the institution of education has been informed by systemic and historical happenings um, and formations. We know that um, black people are getting murdered in the streets. We know that, that our planet is, um, under attack. We know that indigenous people need their land back. Um, we know that there's Latinx kids in cages. We know that there's family separation that's been happening. Um, we know that there's forms of assimilation and ethnic cleansing that's happening globally. Um, there's attempted erasure and genocide. And within um, schools and classrooms and, and departments, we have this, these notions of epistemicide happening, which is the erasure of knowledge. Um, and there's certain types of knowledge that are given credibility and there's other types of knowledge that are trying to be erased and silenced because they know that that knowledge will help get us free. And so in terms of, again, thinking about this notion of um, cultural relevance, BIPOC as in Black, Indigenous and people of color, um, youth and adults, we do have the access to the agency and the power and the knowledge to fight for ourselves and our communities and our lives to build solidarities across community um, and to engage in acts of mutual aid and reciprocity. Um, education should not be a one-way street. It should not be that the adults have the knowledge and the power and the kids and the youth are silenced and oppressed. It should be um, these acts of engaging in mutual reciprocity, meaning what can I give as a teacher leader and what can students give um, as youth and thinking about families and their embodied knowledge and how can we continue to work and really disrupt um, what is deemed as credible and what is deemed as brilliant in education to make sure that we're not continuing to uphold functions of um, achievement that are rooted in white supremacy, that we're not upholding and valuing standards of achievement and success that are based on eugenics. Um, when we think about standardized testing, for example, um, standardized testing was justified because of eugenics, which was trying to scientifically approve that black people were inherently and biologically less intelligent than white people. We still have those same types of metrics that gave rise to standardized testing happening today in and across our schools. And we need to change that because we need to know, um, people of color need to know, our babies, our, our youth need to know um, that we are valued and that we are brilliant and that we are powerful and beautiful. Um, in terms of the how, we need to really radicalize the politics of education and po the political being the distribution of and access to power. Um, what does power look like? How can we switch and make a shift from oppressive power to liberating power? How can we shift from um, hierarchies in education 
to more of a horizontal framework of power so that we are all contributing and all holding hands in solidarity towards this just future in education. Um, we have to unlearn and relearn and un unbuild and rebuild um, this education system through praxis. We have to disrupt normative socialization processes. Um, and I say socialization because in education, what's happening is this socialization process. There's these implicit biases that continue to charge how we think about ourselves and how white people see people of color. Um, and so that is giving rise in the most, I guess, um, terrible example of police brutality and the murders and attacks on black people. Um, we have to be getting in the way of these implicit biases. Um, and we can't just think about valuing the resilience and the grit um, and, and, the, and say that our, our students of color need to heal because that's an attack on them. It's perpetuated um, interge intergenerational trauma when we're not grasping the root of these problems. And so I love this quote by Dr. Angela Davis, radical simply means grasping things at the root. Sometimes when I say radical, like within my institution, people are like, what does that mean? And I'm like, it means grasping things at the root. It means getting to the root of the problems to better understand what they are to better help us inform how we're going to move forward. And in the what, there's so much that we're doing right now. There's so much that we're thinking about. And just for the sake of time, I'll click here just to give some examples. So what we're doing in North Shore is thinking about hearts and minds work. We created a professional development syllabus, not a scope and sequence this year for all of our educators. Um, we have over 3000 educators. Um, and we're trying to think about this in terms of praxis. We're not starting in the classroom context. That would be um, thinking district wide starting too small. How can we think about like this yo-yo effect of expanding our concepts and our frameworks of education and better understanding the why of this work so that we can really drill down and make sense of it at the classroom level. Um, and so we're doing that through giving broader historical examples, thinking about current manifestations, thinking about future projections and how we can shift those trajectories. Um, we're, we're changing procedures in terms of hiring and recruiting. Um, from the 27-2018 school year to this school year, we've increased our certificated administrators of color by 112.5%. Um, and we've increased our elementary teachers by about 30% and our secondary teachers by about 35%. That's because the system was designed to keep people of color out. And our job is to continue to think about how we can remove those institutional barriers. Um, in terms of thinking about and reshaping approaches and priorities in leadership, um, we have school action plans, we have a template and we noticed that equity or cultural relevance wasn't even embedded in that. And so we reshaped and shifted the template to make sure that that was represented and that it wasn't an option for administrators to not enter into their leadership practice through that lens. Um, thinking about reimagining pedagogy, we're, we're building out P12 ethnic studies frameworks so that it's not just a standalone class, but it's also frameworks that can be taught and, and integrated throughout um, from preschool to 12th grade. Um, we're trying to continue amplifying the voices that students already have. It's not about when I decide to hand a student a mic, then they can have the mic. It's how can we empower students to grab the mic themselves, but creating the conditions necessary so that that's cultivating a space of belonging for them. Um, one of the things we're working on is a student social justice task force. Um, cultivating family and community partnerships. We have a racial and educational justice committee that has shareholders throughout the district in terms of students, staff, family, community members, where we're getting together and learning with and from one another. And then we're increasing accountability at every level and thinking about all of the levels that this work needs to be done. There's four people in my department, we're all people of color and it's not on us to do it alone. And this is not our problem, this is a systems problem. And so how can we get everyone to be working together and join hands in solidarity? Um, lastly, I would just like to end on this quote, an educator in a system of, in a system of oppression is either a revolutionary or an oppressor. There's not, I'm not racist, you're either racist or anti-racist. 
Um, that's what I tell like my, my white colleagues that I'm working with. Um, but we really have to, we have this moment and it's a long overdue moment, over 400 years past due of a moment to really revolutionize education. I will end there and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas, for just those salient points, uh, for grounding us in the spirit of our ancestors first, for thinking uh, about these structural inequalities that happen not just here within the United States, but that this is a global framework of systematic oppression. And so thank you so much for, for that. And to all of our panelists uh, today for just sharing those uh, invaluable insights. We are running close <laughs> in terms of time. And so we want to open up uh, the space now for our question and answer section. And so please uh, feel free to utilize the chat feature in order to um, ask our amazing panelists here um, questions. I am actually going to go ahead and begin by asking one of the first questions just to give our um, our guest here some time to kind of think through those questions and then drop them in the in the chat feature there. Uh, one of the first questions, and I'll op open this up to everyone, is in your work, what have you witnessed as being the biggest barriers to achieving equity in education? And then how can we work through these to achieve better outcomes for students? So Again, just some of the, the biggest barriers that you see in terms of your work. Well, I'll jump in um, quickly. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, and actually this is a question I was gonna ask myself if I got a chance of uh, Ms. Thomas. Um, there, I think there's a, a, a high degree of receptivity, at least in the schools that I work with, with a lot of what we're talking about. It gets to be a different story at the board level, um, at the level of who kind of holds the decision-making power within within um, school systems. Um, and so, I mean, so in terms of answering your question, I mean, one of one of the things that has been um, you know difficult to overcome is um, the reluctance reluctance of political leaders to take a stance firmly in favor of anti-racist education, for example, and and to put their money literally where their mouth is. Um, Given competing kind of priorities, and also the fact that they they mostly answer to the public and to the politic um, and the body politic of, of the of their community as opposed to the system itself or the students within it or uh, and their families. So, overcoming um, those kinds of barriers and one of the really most interesting ways that I've seen lately how this has happened um, is not actually in the United States; it's in Toronto, Canada, where um, the board of um, the Toronto District School Board um, itself took on the um, uh, task of of collecting data to begin with on um, on the differences between um, in this instance particularly black and white students and black boys particularly in outcomes both with regard to achievement but also um, just life outcomes and use that as a an interesting approach, use that as a, um, a starting point for conversations with the community to ask the broader community, including communities of color within Toronto um, metropolitan area, um, what is their experience? What is their understanding of, um, of their child's experience within schools? And, and using that, that sort of qualitative database along with the, the sort of statistical database to make a case internally within the system for why these changes need to occur. And then it took a very courageous um, superintendent and a really courageous uh, group of, of, um, of, of his colleagues to you know, dive deeply into very specific kinds of forms of racialized oppression. For example, in looking at special education and noting that um, you know, the, the number of kids who are in special education is predominantly non-white kids, even though the, the, that is not the case with regard to the population of the overall district. And so just saying, you know, is this an example of structural racism to put, to put and, and, and actually name it as such um, and to name it essentially, particularly as anti-black racism. Um, and then to use that as a means by saying, okay, so it, it, it certainly seems so. I mean, the data says, it says this, the experience of our parents talking about their kids experience tells us this, what are we going to do about it? And then using that as a launching pad for really taking um, aim at, at how you 
change systemically um, that kind of process. Um, but it, it was a mixture of both um, courage and use of data and um, engagement of community that I think um, was uh, a means by which that, that, that barrier was overcome. But again, back to your question, I, I do think the political um, atmosphere and kind of context within which systems operate is really one of the most difficult barriers to overcome. I, I, I'll jump in next. Um, I think that the, one of the things that I notice is really difficult is trying to get people to think outside of, you know, in terms of cultural context, trying to get people to think about the issues that are happening outside of the cultural context that is in the mainstream. Because the mainstream cultural context is a white supremacist cultural context. And if you've been trained to think inside of that, of that paradigm, but you don't know how to think outside of it, then even the things that you say that go against it are still coming from that grounding. So one of the things that, one of the reasons I like to study Afrocentric schools is because they're using context from an African thinking pl platform. They're, their grounding is different. So when, I, so when I watch people try to think through these problems and they're coming from the same paradigm as the people who caused the problems, I realize that we're going to enter into a tautology. We're gonna chase our tail and we're not gonna solve anything. So we have to be, begin to become more comfortable thinking, uh, I guess the first thing would be to, to, to um, study outside of the Eurocentric cultural context, the European cultural context, and not just think of ourselves as living in opposition to white supremacy, but begin to figure out what it means to, to, to think of ourselves as living in for our, in our, and inside of our own cultural interest. I don't think we're comfortable with that yet. I think we're okay with the fight, but we're not okay with uh, our own stuff and not fighting, but instead, you gotta fight sometimes, but instead also being comfortable with adopting your own cultural perspective. It's a point of just discomfort for our community. We don't want to do that. Um, but we're eventually going to be forced to do it. Uh, so I think it would be better for us before force, being forced when we realize there's really not much, uh, there's, they don't have much to offer and the trinkets and the luxuries that are there uh, will eventually not be there. What we'll be left with is um, what we started with, which has been, um, has been taken away, but it can be retrieved as well. So I think we have to get more into who we are and what we're for, and not so comfortable with just focusing on what, on what we're against. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Shockley. Um, we have actually several questions now flooded here in the chat. Uh, and so I'm going to um, ask Ms. Thomas this very first question, um, which reads, as your, um, as your goal work, as your work is to empower students in the classroom, what have you tried, especially in relation to students? What have you observed? Um, what has worked well so far? And then what did not work? And I can um, say that again, because that's kind of a lot there. Um, again, as you've been working in this space, working with students, um, what have you tried, especially as it relates to students? What have you observed that has worked? and what has not been um, as successful? Yeah, I think I'll start with what, what hasn't worked. <laughs> um, what hasn't worked is trying to be so confined and restricted and restrictive in um, student voice and thinking about um, how to, if you're not going against the grain in education, you're going with the ebbs and flows of white supremacy. And so I think part of it is I used to be under the assumption that I had to do this work for students um, and even thinking about black students. I had to do this work for them. Um, I had to do this work for my younger self 
Um, and, and what I really found in my master's degree research in cultural studies was um, that I had to do this work with them and that it wasn't me that needed to enter in as their savior, but how can I um, work to work with them to make sure that they know what empowerment looks like, but that they're not asking for it from me um, and I can walk alongside them on their journeys. And so f as an example, um, I've, I've been meeting with um, the black student unions at each of our high schools and going in there and asking them about asking them questions about what they need, what they see wrong with their education, um, what they're thinking about in terms of what are we fighting against and then what are we fighting for? Um, and then thinking about it in terms of um, like guest speakers. There's been a couple guest speakers that have come in who have said some things that have been a little off and I'll just sit back and like let them talk and see if the students will engage or speak up for themselves because I can see the body language in the room um, and then at the end, you know, there was this one time where there was a speaker, no one was asking questions. And then at the end, I was like, I have a question. I'm going to disrupt this a little bit and make this space uncomfortable. Um, and then after that speaker left, I had some of the students come up to me and say, wow, thank you so much for asking that question. We were thinking the same thing. And I asked them, why didn't you ask those questions? Um, and what can I do to support you in feeling empowered to ask those questions? because you already have the answers inside of you through embodied and historical knowledge um, and maybe even academic knowledge. But what does it mean for you to ask the questions um, in terms of thinking about what hadn't worked and then what's working now? We created a student equity committee. Um, and again, it was like very rigid timelines on things and um, a, a very specific application process. We weren't getting um, a lot of diversity represented within the group. And then I had to go back and think about why that was. And then I talked with students of color and was like, hey, you know, why couldn't you make it or why didn't you sign up? And they were like, well, there's this broad application process. I just want to show up and be present and like talk about justice and talk about what I need. Or, you know, I can't because I have little brothers and sisters that I have to drive um, after school or I have to watch them. So we're shifting to a student social justice task force right now and thinking about, um, right now I'm in the inquiry process. So another thing I learned was not just coming in with thinking I know the answers, but coming in posing questions. And so right now I'm still in the inquiry process of talking with students um, and our minor minoritized students to see what they need and what they'd like to get out of a um, student social justice task force. Um, and, and helping them create and frame the task force how they envision it to be. Thank you so much for that. Um, panelists, do you have time for one more question? Because I realize now that we are uh, over time. I, I, I'm good with one more. I got, okay. Yeah, that's okay, about great, it. <laughs> great. Um, so with that in mind, we have lots of questions here for you all in the chat. Um, and so I am going to try to pull one out of here that I think is, is really relevant. I see a lot of questions that are really centered around being able to kind of continue this work as aspiring educators and teachers. And so um, I guess that is one of my, my last questions to you that really kind of encompasses all of this and brings this home. We are um, at an institution like Howard University who does great work in terms of pre-service education and preparing um, teachers to go into the workforce to really help center children um, in terms of their own educational experiences. And so what recommendations, what suggestions would you have for aspiring teachers who are going into this work? Um, I can speak first. I think that it's really grounding yourself and who you are and who you know yourself to be. Um, I think it goes back to really thinking about our identity and claiming our identity and the beauty in our identities um, and showing up authentically. Um, it can be really difficult being a, a young woman of color working in a white supremacist institution um, and I try to claim agency over 
my schedule and where I prioritize my time. Um, I try to carve out spaces that are affinity group spaces. So how can, um, example, we started a staff of color coalition that's specifically for staff of color so that we can talk um, in community with one another um, and, and really trying to fight the respectability politics that come up and that can be so violent um, complicitly against us. And so um, just thinking about being your authentic self and remembering who you are through this process of self-determination um, and rather than thinking about yourself through these notions of white supremacy and racism. We need to claim the beauty and the brilliance for and within ourselves. I'll, I'll go next. I couldn't agree with that more. Um, I think it's really important, the, the identity piece that Ava Thomas just talked about. I think that if you're going to be a teacher um, in, in a school system, you one of the things to remember is the important quote that was shown a, a minute ago and that said that if uh, either when you're in an oppressive system, you're either an oppressor or you're a revolutionary and a liberator. That becomes really, really important and understand that black children are in a, um, are, are, are in a war. And so they need for you to stand up for them, not just try to draw your paycheck. Um, there's a lot of teachers in the school system who are really good at drawing a paycheck, but aren't really good at getting our young people ready uh, to think outside of the paradigm, the Eurocentric paradigm that's being used to think about everything right now, even the anti-racist stuff is very Eurocentric. We cannot continue to think inside, uh, only inside of a Eurocentric paradigm and think we're going to move forward. That's one of the tricks that they're playing on us. Um, so I think that teachers have to be readers and thinkers and leaders and not anti-intellectual. I'm meeting too many teachers who are anti-intellectual. So we, we now as, as you would think that there's no way you can be a teacher, a person who should be into knowledge and love knowledge and love the, the process of, 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 of philosophy gaining wisdom and not and be anti-intellectual, but it is possible. I'm meeting doctoral students and master students who are anti-intellectual. Okay, so we, we, have a, we have a crisis going on of people not wanting to use their brain, the power of their mind, but instead are just there to become careerists, people who are getting the degrees and stuff, and they'll talk some stuff when they have my class or your class or whatever, but really what they're trying to do is to gain that, uh, that economic piece and then get out there and just do what everybody else is doing. But our young people are suffering as a result of that approach being uh, the one that's taken too often. Uh, so we don't need any more teachers, black or any other color, who are just there to get a paycheck and who are not willing to be part of, of the new thinking movement, if you will. We need people who are part of a thought movement and who are part and who are willing to do the work of being able to think outside of the Eurocentric paradigm. Uh, so I'll, I'll offer that for new teachers. Uh, Welcome to the profession and hope that uh, you'll be part of, on the right side of, of our fight. Um, I think everything uh, that has been said is, is so right on. I don't have a great deal to add, but I, I tend to be a tactician and a practical person. Um, and given what I believe is exactly the right sort of, um, what has been said around kind of creating a, you know, your own sense of identity and, and the mindset that goes into this, um, I would just say that um, I think teachers need to realize going into the profession that um, if you really want to keep the outcomes that we're talking about in mind as the purpose of what you're, what you're in education for, that is to, in my view, um, create um, activists against racism and other forms of oppression among your students, then you have to realize basically you're engaging in a subversive activity and you need to sort of embrace that. Um, the system is not going to do that for you. Um, and so um, to a certain extent, you need to find the cracks in the, uh, in the system and the opportunity structure and find ways to engage in the kind of education that needs to happen um, uh, where there is opportunity to do so um, as we fight the larger fight of systemic kind of a change. So um, one way, for example, that I, you know, all of the teachers that we work with, we encourage is to um, teach um, through projects and to have those projects um, uh, um, lead to students um, having taken the reins of power in their own hands to 
um, themselves create uh, pro um, you know responses to those projects and and ways of acting that um, you know activate their own activism and and so that their learning becomes actually community-based activity that they're actually performing their understanding and their knowledge in the in the basis of going out and tell, testifying in public or leading a demonstration or whatever it is that in the real world gets things done is is actually what is being part of the curriculum and the way in which you're teaching kids, kids to learn and then use their knowledge in the service of their own um, you know their own their own liberation as it were so um, just just kind of know that it's going to be um, an outside inside kind of uh, structure and, and, and fight that you're going to be engaged in and to embrace that um, and not and have the courage to, to, to do so. Thank you so much for that. Um, just to add a couple of uh, final thoughts, thank you so much to all of our uh, panelists here today and thank you to everyone who joined in uh, with us today for this compelling and very robust conversation. It was absolutely um, wonderful. Um, I personally learned so much just in terms of the you know, importance of language and why that matters and considering the intersectional frameworks because gender also matters. Um, and so there are so many, um, so many important takeaways that we've gleaned from this conversation. Um, we are definitely over time. So again, I thank all of our panelists, thank all of you for joining us today. I'm gonna to turn it over to Gabrielle for our last thoughts. I know everyone has to get on with the rest of their days and their meetings. So I just wanted to, again, thank all of you guys for coming. Um, there were so many more questions in the chat that we didn't get to. Um, and so if the panelists would be willing, I would love to kind of put those together and maybe we can get your thoughts on a few of these and share them out to our participants. Um, and other than that, just thank you so much for, for coming to the, together for this conversation. We really would love to have another hour or two hours to talk about this, but um, since we can't, there might need to be some kind of part two um, at some point in the future. So thank you again, everybody. Um, have a great rest of your week. And we will um, be sharing this recording for people who didn't get to join us or if you wanted to watch back. And so for all the participants and panelists, you guys will get a link to that soon. So thank you again, and we will hopefully be connecting with you guys again soon.